call this um, work session of the King William County Board of Supervisors to order. Ms. Lawrence, could you call the roll, please? Mr. Muskowski? Here. Mr. Hodgins? Here. Mr. Garber? Here. Mr. Morin? Here. Mr. Greenwood? Here. First thing on the agenda, we have the review and adoption of the meeting agenda. Any questions, concerns? I move we adopt the agenda as presented. Sorry. We have a motion made properly seconded. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman. Yes. New kind of question. Are we allowed to have new business? I would think so. That would be probably under the Board of Supervisors' request. We could probably put it in there. Yeah, just last minute thoughts. Or... Sure. Mm -hmm. Want to add it or? Uh, please. Okay. And uh, new. So maybe edit the... Well, or, or, Mr. Chairman, does that fall under that last one that we've had out there? Like the Board of Supervisors <laughs> request. Just to kind of cover that in five if anybody has any questions. Okay. Anything okay. Anyone new, do we sure. Add yeah. it there? Okay. So put it in there, but I don't guess we need to really revise it. So anything else? Okay. Uh, Ms. Lawrence? Mr. Hodges? All right. Mr. Garber? Aye. Mr. Morin? Aye. Mr. Muskowski? Aye. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. Next uh, item, we have work session matters for a fire and EMS. So Ms. Lauren Nunley, Interim Chief of Fire and Emergency Services. Good evening, gentlemen. How are you? You look pretty good. Uh, I gave you a lot in your packet. I'm going to go through it like I do in any of my other presentations where I do it by staffing personnel, which is how the packet is broken down. If you have any questions, please ask. Um, I have brought with me, the very last thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the response map and talk about our response model and what's going on with that. Um, I have brought with me Dave Foster. He is one of our very dedicated volunteers. You'll see him in the back corner. He has put in over 600 hours in 2019 of volunteering at the station, not including this project for each of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, to get started, um, what you guys got in, in your board packet for me is just a lot of the projects we have been working on for the past eight months. So that you can kind of see a little bit of what is going on, what streamlining we have been doing, and everything to kind of get us on board to where we needed to be. We updated all of the job descriptions. The original job descriptions were um, scarce with some of the fire necessities that needed to be in there and some of the physical necessities that needed to be in there. So we brought them into line more with the actual job. Um, as far as staffing goes, we have filled one of the three spots that we're advertising right now. One of our part-time people has chosen to leave their full-time department and come to us full-time. So he is already here full-time and is a full-time fire EMS and is a great, great thing for us to have. Um, February is not a rough month for staff. That's the biggest thing that I need to point out. In the past month, in all of my time since I, since, um, Chief Arnold and I have taken over. We have never gone below minimum staffing of three. In the month of February, it happened four times, and three other times, either myself or Chief Nunley had to show up at the firehouse to just make that second unit go out. Um, most of that is because, although we planned for the holidays really, really well, and we managed to staff around that, most of that was with everyone being sick. Um, as soon as everybody started to get sick, not only is it our full-time employees who get sick, they're sick, so we had four of them get sick. Um, but what happened around us is our part-time people and their fire departments. They then had to come back from the mandatory overtime because their fire departments were feeling the heat of everybody being sick. So and that was a rough month where we, we just kind of felt that we, we really need some more staffing with that. Any questions pertaining to staffing? Or any many, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, many times looking at your organization, I, I continually hear from the public, and I think you defined it just now, that they're working supervisors. They're saying a lot of folks think it's top heavy. That's what I'm getting No, it is, it is not top heavy. Most of them are out in the field and are working supervisors. You will see, if you come into the office throughout the week, you will see that there are field people in the office at times. Um, one of our supervisors has taken over staffing and our staffing program. That was something that was done by the administrative assistant. One of the problems with that and just dumping that into a more basic spot is that you have to know a little something about fire and EMS. You have to understand what we do and where you can put positions. 
So although currently he is on maternity leave, you are seeing him here, but he also still does shifts at the field. Uh, Fitzgerald was pulled into the field to help with special projects, to just kind of get us through the hump of what we needed to do, get caught up, get all of everything online, bring everything streamlined, because we were falling behind on that with so much work. He did that, and he is actually back in the field again. So the only two people that you actually have that do not go into the field, kind of, after <laughs> this one, are myself and the senior battalion chief, Stacey Reeves. And would you also mention for the public and the other board members that don't know the number of volunteers that we have now? Yes, sir. We have a total of 14 volunteers. Out of those 14 volunteers, six of them are fire certified, five of them are fire and EMS certified, and three of them are just EMS certified. And those are our volunteers that come to the firehouse, are actually on fire trucks, doing things, participating in training. We see them. Dave is a perfect example. Um, Terry Osborne and Epi run every other Friday. They run our first out medic unit. They don't have any fire experience. But there are one is a paramedic, one is an EMTA, and it's fabulous because what it does is it gives our guys a break. They go out on the first out EMS call every other Friday for nine hours. So that means that our guys can do an actual training without being interrupted. It gives them just some downtime. So because of the month that we've had, some of our guys are pulling 48, 72 hours. So that's just a nice break for them to have, although a break in the fire service doesn't mean we're sitting in the recliners watching TV. <laughs> it just allows them to participate in some of our events without being interrupted to answer a 911 call. Okay, personnel, we just kind of touched on this a little bit when we were asking, when you were asking about the lieutenants and being top heavy. We do have four lieutenants, um, and as I said, three of them. What we are finding is when the cat's away, the mouse will play. Um, is a very true statement, and so we need to, in order to bring consistency, we have to have supervisors in there. And if you look at the organizational chart, the supervisors that are there, um, they are all field supervisors down below. And so they, are, they are out in the field. There are part-time employees. They are each assigned to one shift. So therefore, if they are not physically in the firehouse and someone who is assigned to them from our full-time staff needs them, they can get a hold of them. It also allows us to streamline communication. We kept finding problems with that, where the telephone game and so forth would go through and we would not get all of the information. And we found, in talking with some of the volunteers, that communication was not making it to them appropriately. So what we decided to do is take our other lieutenant, and his job is to make sure that all communication does get to volunteers. So one is dedicated to the volunteers that they can call, email, do what they need to get their questions Okay, the lieutenant and the OIC, are they, they're two different people? They are. The lieutenant is an actual officer with bars on him. Mm -hmm. That lieutenant is certified with a number of classes. He's also been someone who has worked as a lieutenant or an acting lieutenant in other fire departments. So they're able to make decisions. They have years of training behind them to be able to do everything they need to do. The OIC is when I do not have a person in play who is one of our guard lieutenants, it then falls back onto an officer in charge, which is just a title for the day, and that makes one person in charge of the entire crew. Again, for communication, being able to make decisions. It's also allowing us, we have a kind of a rotating group who are able to be in that OIC position, so it allows our officers to start working with them one-on-one -on -one and training them and getting them where they need to be. Next, we move on to training. I did put in here our very, very long DOS protocol book. I do not expect you to look through it all, but this is just one of the two books that have gone into play where anyone who gets their EMTB comes into the field, this is what they have to go to be released. There's an ALS one being developed right now, and we're developing one that has to do with all the fire skills that are your basic fire skills and needs. Does this, um, I see knowledge of skills and abilities, do you track, I'm trying to recall how we did it, uh, the, the level of skill, the skill level 
there are various entry, and then there's intermediate, and of course there's. Do you track to that scale, to that level? Yes, we do. Um, and that that depends on who sits where. And if the very first page with the cleared providers, that's the beginning of the tracking. Um, and this that you're looking at just tells us who is able to operate a piece of equipment, and then who is able to teach another person how to operate a piece of equipment. And then as their levels grow, both on fire and EMS, there's, you can move up levels with both, and we track all of that. And then our plan is to put into play JPRs with your job performance reviews that will go into the firehouse. That's one of our new tenants is going to be taking over that, and he will be going through all that and, and going over the JPRs with every single person so that we can make sure that we're staying where we're at level-wise and that we continue to grow. Do you get check rides from outside agencies? Check rides. Do you ever have anyone come in from outside and give you a check ride? Just a you familiar with the, in the aviation world where a check pilot comes in and assesses a pilot's skills? Do you get anything from the we, outside? So we do. The office of EMS will come in and do that. Um, they will they will actually do spot checks so we don't know they're coming and they will come in and they'll see what they're doing see what we're doing they'll spend a day with us and do all of that to see in the fire world it doesn't work as much that way um, they, there's no VDEM there's not excuse me not VDEM uh, Virginia Department of Programs does not come in and do spot checks so to say in that aspect so now I have in my years of the fire service I have worked on committees of other departments all meshed together trying to figure out ways to maybe make things better, or I've got to ride along with another place to say, okay, here's what we're looking at improving, watch how we work, let's put our brains together and see. Good? Okay, training. Um, we just today got our 2020 training power complete, so it will be out there, it's for everyone who is in the fire station to know. The way it will happen so it stays consistent is every day on our swing schedules is given a day. Tuesday is a DMS day, Thursday is a code day, and so whatever day you show up, not the actual date, but the day of the week, that tells you what you're going to train on. We have done several weekend trainings with Mango Pitch, some with Walkerton, where we have gotten together over the past couple of months and done some ladder drills. I know they cut a car two weekends ago and did some extrication drills there. Uh, MRMC has offered to come in and teach one of their doctors to come in and teach our staff about strokes and what happens once the stroke, what we're really good about getting the stroke to the hospital, but then what happens afterwards and what we can do to better help them and make sure that we do the best for the patient. And we have found several issues with our, it's called a NIPR system, which is the National Fire Incident Reporting System. The big thing about this system is that this helps us with our brain. And this helps us nationally on a federal level, level decide what grants need to be funded and where they need to come from. So just for how our system has been set up and how our gentlemen and ladies are reporting is not the best for that. We have a gentleman from the city of Richmond who is highly trained and has gone through all the National Fire Academy courses who is willing to come in and do a four-hour class per shift to get them on board and make sure that they understand the points they need to be hitting them. Could, could you mention one other thing? I, I asked Ms. Tessner responded to me. So the folks that do read this whole package on, on their web, the, those codes for those lockboxes and stuff are no longer any good. No, sir. And that was 100% my error. The door code was not good. Um, as soon as I got the text message and read it, which was two hours after it came through, I do apologize about that. It was immediately changed. And the next morning, the one that could not be changed, they went to the store, got a new lock, and fixed it. Does everybody know what you're referring to on that? <laughs> page 25. Yes, page 25. Okay, apparatus. The tanker needs to be tired. We're working on that. We've got quotes. We're waiting for them to come in. The new answer in tomorrow. Should be done tomorrow. The new ambulance is finally ready for inspection. Any questions you want from me tonight tonight to do it because I have to fly down there for final inspection during the board meeting. So I didn't want to miss two board meetings in a row without questions. 
After that happens, hopefully we can turn around rather quickly. Keep in mind, once it makes it back to the state, it then has to go to the radio shop and be equipped with all the radios. The AFG grant from fire truck was submitted. Um, we got final confirmation on that today. Everything is good there, not meaning that we have been awarded it, but everything we need is in there. And we're going to cross our fingers and do whatever we can to make that happen. We also, in the midst of this, uh, started to talk about SCBA, which is our breathing apparatus. We have been discussing with Chief Bartos and also with uh, Chief Warren Haley of the Mango Hit. All of us are talking about going to the same kind of SCBA, which is safety-wise amazing. Also would put us into the same SCBA as our surrounding counties. Also a huge safety issue. And if we could figure out a way to do it as a group, it would grant-wise, it would open a lot of doors for us. So that is something that we're looking at doing. Can't guarantee that it's going to happen that we can do it as a grant that way, but we are definitely in a better vote to work as a team together than one-on-one -on -one individual small fire houses. Generally speaking, how long is the uh, evaluation process for these grants? One year? Or? No, they, when they come through there, and it depends grant by grant, grant. They can be awarded within three months, some of them within six months. Um, and trip, how quickly does the firehouse grant turn around? That one's usually a month and a half. Yeah, that, and they do that quarterly. So, so we would know reasonably, reasonably so. And when we're trying to decide what to do budget-wise and where we're going to put our money and what we need to do, that's a huge factor. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, what, what's going to, what expires, what's going to be a training and a safety issue, and how quickly do we need to do it? It's, it's Russian roulette. Which way? Where do I want to put my money? Station one. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there any other apparatus questions? I know that the apparatus section was also a larger section. Uh, and this is just the breakdown of everything we have done in the apparatus section to bring everything up and have repaired. The reason why you find the pictures in there is we, I'm constantly talking about different trucks to you, so it gave you something to reference and look at. What hazmat responses could you have? Have we had? Or I, the see the, I see the trailer there. The hazmat trailer was awarded on a grant years ago. Um, it is there, it has some equipment, it is a very basic and it needs to be gone through to see, I mean, has that, everything has to be checked, dated, tested, all of that stuff. So it was a word on the grant long before we were ever in the picture and it's sitting back there. It's a great trailer, it's in good use. We don't wanna, we don't wanna lose it, but we are not going to uh, save us from the big green stuff on that little trailer. <laughs> Station one, and the biggest two things that we have going on with Station one is the first part is that we are working on broadband. You saw that in your packet. Travis has been absolutely wonderful. We have been working together to try to figure out the best way to do this because we need to have the service. Right now, we are literally working on the hotspots, Verizon hotspots, is how we're getting our service. So we're going to do reporting, all of that stuff. It's not very good. But what we also don't want to do is we realize that Atlantic Broadband is in the business of sales. <laughs> so we need to figure out the best way to do it where it will work for everyone. And then the hall, the banquet hall that they rent, that would work as a secondary EOC for the county. So if for some reason we could not use the first one or we needed to operate off of two, we want to set that room up to have that capability. The sheriff's office does have a portable communication center that they can bring down to it, which would work in there. And we want to keep that in mind moving forward because it would cost us more money to go back and add all that in. But we also don't want to put a bunch of stuff in there that we may never touch in 15 years and we're paying for. But the Sheriff's Department is moving into that new building. Won't they be in that building anyway? They will be in that building, but your communication is not going to be in that building at all. Oh. And, and understand, we're not moving up there. It's just a, just a okay. satellite office. Yes. Right. Okay. So it's not going to have any capability. Yeah. No. And I thought at Atlantic Broadband, they were coming around, they were going to, if they would bring, bring the service to all the residences and as they went by, they're not going to bring it to it's the way, station. It's a ways off the road. So. Oh, it is? Okay. If it had been right there, it probably would have. Well, I think they could, we could probably discuss it with them, right. being what it is. There. Where does it stop at? Can it? Does it, does it go there? It's oh. everywhere. It's yeah, they're actually, they're bringing it down to the firehouse. They've come out, they've looked at it. We actually have one coax cable that's already running through there. and. As we, as I start to talk, we're going to get out of my specialty. 
Um, that one cable is there. We don't, that'll save us about $12,000 in work that would have to be done. The second thing that needs to do is we need to run a backup, a backup cable in case for some reason we lose, we lose that cable because that's what we're operating and using on. So what they're doing is they're bringing in a second cable um, that will be an armored cable that is more protected and shelled so that we can take care of that and make sure no matter what, that fire station and the satellite police station, they're working with those to take a look at it because they're right there and they're out. Again, nothing nothing formal has been done with them yet. We're just trying to figure out what's best moving forward and what's going to make the most sense. Any projected uh, cost yet? Or? No, because we're still back and forth. Yeah. They, they did give us one. Um, they gave us one with about $1,500 a month was what they were quoting us. And after speaking with Travis, and he has been involved in every single meeting with me, that is our new IT gentleman. Um, after speaking with him, and us kind of going around Robin on how things have been done in other places for me and, and what he knows, we are trying to figure out ways to maybe make that a little bit better, which well, makes more sense. Please keep me in the loop on that because I've developed a decent relationship with the managers. Absolutely, they've been absolutely wonderful. Yeah, and, and the biggest problem we're having is the actual building. Because it is so large, we've got to figure out, we've got to get, we live on one side, we, we have the second side that would be a backup EOC, and then we have this gigantic football field in between us. Right, so that's where our big, that, that's where the big thing is coming in. If they were to have to run different wires in different places, and that's what we're looking at. But I will absolutely, and if you would like to sit in on the meetings with us, that would be fine too, in, in my opinion. Uh, go, go ahead, I'm sorry. I'll hold it. No. It's not related to this. I just missed testing there. The social services T1 line, ISDN line, the Atlantic Broadband Service will support that type. So there's no need to go buy a separate uh, line to, re, uh, to do what they are doing here. If Bill Newberg did, did uh, verify that what their service will be able to blend in and support that type. They've done it in other counties. We'll make sure that EDA representative and Atlantic Broadband talk to each other just to make sure there's no redundancy. I'm oh, sorry. No, you're absolutely fine. Um, I'm going to skip just really quick to the nightworthies. The high school soccer games are starting this month. We are going to be standby just like we did with football games. Um, barring the fact that 911 calls come first, but we're going to try to see if we can make our staffing work to where we can keep someone there. And we're participating in career day at Cool Springs. Once again, they'll be landing a helicopter. We'll have the fire trucks over there and all of that. Any questions on anything so far? All right, now let's get to the map behind me, the good stuff. You have the maps in your book. They're very, very hard to see. Um, and I do understand that. Dave has spent his time putting them together. And what we're looking at here, and unfortunately because of the way the program works, we can, can you bring it in to do the whole county really quick? Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so what we're looking at here is this is obviously our county, and because our county is so long and thin, getting it in the whole box is difficult. Down here is our West Point area. This is West Point's first due. Anywhere you see a dot on there, that's where we have responded in to help West Point for one reason or another. There are several calls in, the are new kit, whatever is going on. So those are the times that we've done this. This captures from January 1st of 19 to December, the end of December of 19. These are all of our fire and EMS calls. Everywhere you see a blue dot is a fire call, I mean, excuse me, is a EMS call. Everywhere you see a red dot, is a fire call, and then anywhere you see a green dot is a combination. If you go up to Central Garage, this is our Central Garage area where you start to see the combinations. You can see a, a bunch of uh, little green in there. That would be our intersection there at 360 and 30, so that's where we're having those. Lots of our EMS calls in that region, fire calls. If you spread that out to where Fire Station 1 is, this right here, and I'm sorry for everybody out there if you can't see me. This right here is Fire Station 1. Um, that is literally, we had to spread it out because people now know we're staffed, so those are our walk-ins. 
Um, people are now starting to come to the fire station knowing that someone will be there, coming in and just getting out and ringing the doorbell. So, or knocking on the door, excuse me. So that is what the fire station looks like. If you come back out, Just come, keep coming all the way out. So we can look at the three districts. There we go. All right. These, as we said, the West Point, we've, we've gone down there a few times. The most concentration of our calls is in the Central District is what we're calling it for this presentation and for our tracking. It's not called that in the CAD system. We just had to figure out a way to do it so that we could talk about it and make sense. Then this is our Mango Hick District, and then this is our Courthouse District. So you can see where the majority of the calls are and where we're going. So this does not include calls at West Point to nor Mango. No, this is just fire station one. No, I'm sorry. All calls. All calls. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's all calls all with calls. the exception of in, West Point. In the West Point. No, no, with the exception of West Point. No, we don't get. We don't get West Point's people. numbers. I was going to say. No, no, West, there are a lot more than that. no, no, no. These are if West Point, these down here, if West Point is on a call and we have to come all the way down the county, right. that's what these darts are. But when Loretta gives us numbers, we don't get West Point's numbers at the end of the month. When we originally when this plan originally started, it became such a, a, a numbers event that we had to change the, from pins to stars to dots to fit them all on here. And one of the big problems we were going to have in the town of West Point, <clears throat> they run just as many runs as we do, but their their town is that big around. So when we would put that on a presentation, even if I were to have given it to Chief Bartos, it's just going to show one color because it, it's such a small area. You really have to narrow it down to street views to be able to track all of their stuff. And ours is much larger. Our area is so much larger, it's so much more spread out that we were able to do this. And uh, now we have duplicates in here, and sometimes more than duplicates. But uh, but that is your picture for one calendar year of the number of calls that happen in this county, minus the town of West Point. And when you get into the West Point area, because it is so small and how much we would have had to blow it up, it also would have shown that we went to John Smith's house five times. And we be just because of the small area of it, so we did not want to do that. So does that include Mangadu? It does. It does. That's the, the ones that they actually. No, sir. Oh, that's no, sir. what I'm saying. These are just the calls. That these are just the calls. These are the 911 calls that we had in the county this year. Not divided up by who went anything. This is everything with the exception of West. Every month we get a report from CAD. It's a straight download from CAD. It gives us everybody's runs, tells us all the information that we need to know, addresses, times, locations, types of calls. All of that document, all of that data is documented on that map. So every call entered in CAD that was a fire in this run was dispatched inside the county where those lines are, whether it was whether we went, all of us went, just walking and went, Magnetic went, however the numbers go, those are all of your runs. That is a that is a picture of how busy your fire and EMS department is and how many runs this county actually takes. So it doesn't include the runs that West Point came in to help us either. Because it's uh, it does not, and those those numbers are low. Right. The, the same, the kind of the same number. So West Point, Chief Bartos has a deal with Kent, with uh, New Kent. West Point goes to New Kent. New Kent comes to West Point, back and forth. When we go in, it is two ways. One, everybody's out. Or two, Chief Bartos is asked. He will ask, please send Kingway, and then we will we will send whoever we have down there. So the systems work. They're the same system, but they kind of work independently, I guess you could say. West Point does their things. New Kent comes in there and help them. If they need to come out, they do. It's about the same. They come to us this many times. We go to them this many times. But that that picture right there shows you the, the bulk of what happens in this county in a county year. And we just can't make it to West Point like New Kent can. When we're coming from Station 1, that's a 30-minute run, depending on where it is in the West Point, and New Kent can be there in 10 minutes. So it makes much more sense for the citizens to have that service coming in from the weekend than to have it coming all the way down from up at Central Garage, basically. Okay, our next one. Which one did you want? During the time now. Yes. Okay. 
We take the take the uh, hand, Dave, and put it on where the fire station is located. All right. So we did. Um, the, the big question has been response times, response times that have been asked of us, and that's what we have been trying to dig into. We have worked with the sheriff's office to do that to find out exactly what we can do to get a better capture of them. Dave put in response times over and over throughout the whole year, too, and when you go through them, there's lots of holes and things that don't add up. Um, we have been meeting with the sheriff's office. We had a great meeting with them last week where we talked about one of the biggest problems that we have is we have a huge change to the system. One, they're used to police dispatching, because that's what they do. So our lingo is a little bit different than theirs. So we learned that when we say something like clear, that's not that that means we're done and our call is over. The officers don't say that. The deputies don't say that. They say they're available on the radio. So a lot of times those numbers aren't being captured because we're we're not talking the same language. So we had to figure out a way that we could all start to talk the same language to get it to where we could help with our numbers. Um, one of the other things that we found, Dave, will you put up the units, the station unit spreadsheet? In route is counting the uh, In route, there we go. One of the other things we found in talking to the sheriff um, early on is he was having the same radio problems that we were having and we all have the dead areas and we all know about that. One of the dead areas is station one. So what we did, and where you can see the big difference, is back in this time, we were responding from the fire truck or from the ambulance. So it was, it's showing that we are not in route for after the 911 call is dispatched to the station, meaning we receive the tone. We are not in route for 22 minutes and 46 seconds is what it's taking us to actually get in route. Where in fact that's actually not what was going on, that's where we got to a spot where the radio could capture us and they could hear us. So what we then did is we said, okay, not normally how it's done, but let's try to sit this way and see what we get. So we decided we would answer that we were in route from the actual firehouse, because we have a base station right there, you're walking out to the bay, just to see if it would make a difference in times. Which in fact it did. When we answered, because they can always hear us from the base station inside the firehouse. They cannot hear us once we pull out, when they can, a lot of times they can't even hear us in the actual Bay Area. So once we did that, our times came down. Um, you will see there is a huge time difference between the fire and the EMS. The only thing, and this is an educated guess of being a fireman for 25 years, <laughs> the only thing I can guess to why that works is when we hear fire, we move really quick. So they're hitting that, saying we're in wrap, and then they're going out to get, their, get dressed because otherwise they're getting dressed and then they're calling out once we actually get on the road, which will put us at a four minute time. Any questions regarding that? No? Okay. How much of this is getting to know the air? All of it? All of it. You, wait, wait, wait. You asked they're like distance, like time? Well, they're participating with your. All of it? Your... They get all the times. Mm -hmm. um, the times come through us. They come from Loretta to me. Now to Dave and then up to Mango Hicks. So she gives everybody gets their numbers and knows what they are. Alright, back to the the map with the numbers. If you could scroll in a little bit. Um if we talk about an average response time, when we talk about the average response time in the central area, meaning right there around the firehouse, we're averaging slightly under eight minutes to get there. But again, this is where our response time starts to get a little hairy. That's slightly under eight minutes if it's a unit in the firehouse that's there ready to go. So if we have our first out unit. The good news is our response times have gotten a little bit better with that because we have most days a second unit in play. But at any point, if we have to go back, pick up a fire truck, drop off a fire truck, pick up an ambulance, start the equipment switching and so forth that we often do, that will change our times. When we ask about what the average response time is, the fact of the matter is for us to get to your house, one of the best things you can do is take our fire station, if we are in the firehouse and we are sitting there waiting for the call, if you take your our fire station address and your house address and you put in your, the time in Google, that's about what it's going to take us to get there. Um, and we say that because we don't have a teleporter. <laughs> we have lights and sirens. And 
one of the big killers of firefighters and EMS is the fact that we, if we drive too fast or we don't drive right, when we put tankers on the road and we put ambulances on the road, they are gigantic boxes that don't weigh what a normal car does, so their tendency to flip and so forth is much, much easier. And so although it sounds like we can drive really fast and we can just go, 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 we can't. We've got to take into play weather, rain, roads, and all of that. So what Dave has done here is we picked just some central, and you can make the whole thing bigger. And you, I can email these to you individually so you can see them better. I know they're hard to see. But what we've done here is we've gone through, we've just pinpointed intersections throughout the county, and that's where the drive time is. So what are we looking at? Say 18? What, what where is that, Dave? Where 18 minutes is? It's Devon, Bill, and Landy. Okay, it's not far from there. And if you go down... It's 360 hardware, 11 minutes. Mm -hmm. Six, I guess, up above is Central Garage. Yes. It's just a... Yeah. Uh, Walkerton Road, 14 minutes. Here's the courthouse, 15 minutes. This is where it starts getting tough. Medical diary and renovation, 25. If West Point had to make that call, do you have any idea how long it would take them to get there from, from West Point? I do not. We also have a road closure down there that is making life different for everybody. Once we take one road, and that's one of the things when we start looking at how to travel, when we're traveling back roads and we're not traveling main thoroughfares, when you lose a bridge, a big difference. you have to go a different route. Yeah. So one bridge out, one beat out repair, one road closure can actually alter 5, 10, 15 minutes depending on which direction we have to go and how we have to get there. Are these times for the ambulance or the fire? They are average drive times. It would be your personal vehicle. And we did that. And getting to the courthouse area, which I believe we had marked at 15 minutes, is that correct, Dave? Um, so 15 minutes average drive time from firehouse to courthouse which makes a lot of sense. Can we make up some time on that call? Absolutely. If it's 2 o'clock in the morning, maybe, because at 2 o'clock in the morning, we also have to worry about beer. So when we say that, we might be, the average car is going 55 miles per hour, per what Google says. So we might be able to make up a little bit of that drive time, but we don't want to start, we don't want to encourage the speeding and, and the unsafe driving. So we want to make sure that we stay at a safe rate. And the other big thing with us is if, if that ambulance, our second out ambulance, and it gets an accident on the way to that 911 call, we're out of people. So for us, driving within due regard and doing what we need to is very, very important because we had that happen when we hit the deer. The only luck that we had that night is they, the deer sideswiped the ambulance, and it was literally about 600 feet from the house they were going to. So they were able to... Sheriff's Department came and they were able to go check on the patient. It was, I believe, a blood sugar issue. Their blood sugar was fine. We got a waiver and they got to go. It would have been a whole other story had we had a patient who had to be transported and they weren't that close. Dave. To answer the question, uh, according to Google Maps, it would take West Point 28 minutes to get to that same location. Right. That's why the line is actually right there. To, to, to which one? one? To the 30 minute call and it's 28 minutes from West Point. West Point. We're getting the courthouse and that was just there for now. From your house? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that 25? We have the ability to track. We, we can track West Point drones when they come. The West Point squad is assigned to every vehicle accident when trapped in the county. So it doesn't matter at what point on the county line this is, when a vehicle accident when traffic comes out, West Point squad is coming. Um, it is the closest squad that has extra more extrication equipment than we carry in one fell swoop. Um, we made that decision because they're our sure thing. Um, we, we can call, yes, Hanover's closer, Caroline's rescue is closer, but we're not guaranteed to get them. So it's much easier to start West Point coming to us and then find out we're going to get Hanover and cancel West Point and send them back than to make three calls to three different counties, still not be getting anyone. By that point, West Point can almost be to our call. Well, and it was by, it, when we met with Chief Bartos, it was also by request. They run mainly EMS calls. If they have the opportunity to come up to the county to help everybody else, then they wanted to do that. So we, okay, here you go. We'll put you on the ticket. When it comes, let's go. We'll get it up here and we'll do it. We still know it's going to take 30 minutes to get somewhere, but at least we know it's coming. Dave, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, 
and we know it's coming with people who are trained to operate and a lot more and better equipment than we have on our truck. So, Dave. Mr. Hodges, that's 22 minutes. I knew it would be about that. I drive every day. <laughs> so that is where we're at with dispatching. We're going to continue to move forward with the Sheriff's Department to find out better ways that we can work together to capture it. We're also looking at doing NBCs, which are what the Sheriff's officers have in their, um, in their patrol cars, where we can go in and we can hit <clears> buttons to mark us in route on scene, all of those things. What that does is that cuts down on the radio traffic, so that would be helpful. We identified some other things where um, if we are dispatched to a domestic call, we have to stage, meaning we cannot go in. We have to wait for PD to arrive so that we can go in safely. We found out that our arrival clock keeps ticking throughout all of that. So that's also going to skew our numbers. So we want to go ahead and we want to make sure that we can capture and put that into where we can make a staging button and so forth. And hopefully, knock on wood, get our NBCs. And if the radio system improves to this project, we'll actually be able to communicate. I can't give you a solid response time if I cannot give you an arrival time. If we arrive somewhere and our radio says out of range, then we've got a cell phone and we've got to wander around until the call is still happening. We're still there. But I can't give you an arrival time if I can't talk to somebody and tell you I'm there. And we have the reasons for the reasons for some of our gaps and laps in times is I can't talk. If Hypothetically, if two, let's say, handles called a little west one, they have that extraction than us, and, and both of us get there at a similar time, or do both of them uh, charge the insurance company, or, or how, how do you work with that, if you know what I mean? You're asking for like, transport, if, if an ambulance yeah. picks up, yeah. it comes. Right. So if, if King William Fire and EMS's ambulance arrives on scene, takes the patient, puts them in their ambulance, it's their call. Okay. It's their charge. Okay. If Caroline comes in, if Hanover comes in, if West Point comes in, it's theirs. It's their charge. Right. So where Mangahick, when their ambulance is up and their medic is staffed, they run the call, they make the charge. That's their, when we go during the day, if they're not staffed, when we go into Mangahick's district, we run the call, we bill for service. So, so if more than one, I, I, I'm sure that you just answered it, but if, if more than one locality responds and has equipment there, the, the other locale would say it's handover, they, they would receive no reimbursement at all. On the EMS side, if they put somebody in their ambulance, they get reimbursed. Okay. If they bring a fire engine to me to help me with the fire, no, they don't get reimbursed for that. They have, they, we've asked for their help. Lower Upper, Middle, and Lower King and Queen will come to us We've gone to King and Queen. We don't. There is no reimbursement for that part of it. Now, when we take our ambulance to King and Queen, or they bring theirs to us, then whoever the jurisdiction takes the patient is the jurisdiction. To us. Okay. Now we had with the trash truck fire that we had in the summer, we had Hanover's help come in, and we had on our side we had some tramp gear destroyed that we needed to have replaced and so forth. It was an insurance claim. So on something like that, we are yeah. going to call Hanover and say, hey, we're putting this claim in with the company, the trash truck company, not our insurance. Do you, you, know, do you need any gear replaced? Do you need your state or island replaced? And so we work with them to try to keep that in line. So if that is happening, we're all getting what we need. And we did that, and that was accomplished. So every jurisdiction that was there or every department that was there was added to that list for reimbursement for the story. Any other questions for me? Uh, just one personal, I guess, back on page 17 of the orientation packet. It says um, persons offered employment in the county may be required to submit to a controlled substance test. Can you have any heartburn with shall be required? Um, Is that a county thing? So I believe it was how the regulations were written, was it not? For us, you have to have a drug test. I, the Office of EMS, we have to have you drug tested. So. New County employees have to be drug tested as well. And any time there's an employee who's been involved in an auto accident, they also have to be drug tested within 24 hours, which we have exercised. So again, any part of changing that to nope, not an, at all. an imperative of word, will, shall, sure. Yeah. Can I have a page on the please? 17. Okay. One page. Absolutely. Anything else, gentlemen? Starting to feel like sweet too. We've <laughs> been up here a while. Bill has an interview. Got a ways to get to the. How are you going to be 
how, so, based on your thanks. other experience in other areas, how are King William drivers, how do you assess them in their moving over, out of the way, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. It, honestly yeah. Depends, yeah. it honestly depends on the time of day. Um, during, during normal business hours, the non-traffic hours for 360, folks move really well. One of the things that we have to watch when we run up and down 30 is there is no shoulder. So it is a cat and mouse game of, and, and when, when folks drive vehicles, and I follow them on calls to watch, that's part of my job as their supervisor, if, if you can't make a lane, you don't take it. Because there's no, there's no error here. You go too far over on 30, you're in a ditch. You go too far to the left, the log truck hits you. Now i got a bigger problem. They move to the best of their ability. 360's fine. We block the road. We work great with the sheriff's office. Everybody gets around us. It's no big deal. Not a problem. 30, that's where we start to get a little tight when it comes to being able to run an emergency vehicle up in that place. just wonder if Danny Clark would be willing to, if you would write an article, a little uh, article in Country Courier to educate, uh, familiarize, or... How important it is. And just a reminder. I, I see the same thing as people kind of stutter and not sure what to do with sometimes. Well, and that's one of the things that we have to watch when we work with our employees driving. If our employee causes the accident, it's on us. If they blow the light, it's on us. If they, if they create a, an issue for another driver that is trying to yield to us and ends up creating a problem, it's on us. So it, 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 it's a fine line there. If they can move over, great. 30 is one of those roads that some stretches of it, you just don't get to move over. Not until we get to a certain spot. Chief, I, I saw you writing down, if you put down the country courier, it had one of the reviews that actually are official. Because of the multiple. That being a West Point. Uh, press. <laughs> it's never <laughs> sure. Because it's, it's not <laughs> owned by West Point. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Next time we have on the agenda is the resolution for large scale solar power stations. Mr. Ron Edder, Director of Community Development. Good evening. Uh, at the February 26, 2020 Planning Commission work session, the commissioners unanimously agreed to recommend that the Board of Supervisors review the standards, application procedures, and land use suitability relating to large-scale power stations. The commission recommends that application reviews and public hearings for new large-scale power stations be halted until further notice. The Commission feels that this step is necessary to allow for a thorough review of the impact solar facilities have on the county and how solar fits into the future land use of the county. This review should include recommendations for revisions to the performance standards for solar or removal of solar facilities as a permitted use in the county. Uh, the rel the resolu uh, this resolution is intended to apply the conditional use permit applications for solar power stations as defined in the Code of King William. Uh, to wit, solar power station means a system consisting of solar panels, modules, accessory structures, related equipment that collects solar energy and converts it into heat and, and or electricity. It is designed to provide service at the utility scale. This definition, this definition is not intended to regulate solar structures on individual residential or business properties, primarily serving the energy needs for the subject property so long as such structures meet the applicable requirements of local, state, and federal regulation. Utility-scale solar facilities are those that sell power to the grid. The Department of Environmental Quality defines small renewable energy projects <coughs> as solar energy projects at 150 megawatts or less. For the purpose of this resolution, the facility size is not relevant. It's just whether it's a utility-scale or not. Uh, the Planning Commission does intend to form a subcommittee to examine solar in the county and develop recommendations for the Board of Supervisors. The subcommittee should be established at the Planning Commission's next regular meeting scheduled for March 12, 2020. Time frames for completing the review and developing recommendations will be determined by the subcommittee. And um, uh, Chairman Wagner of the Planning Commission uh, called me earlier today and did want to offer up that 
the subcommittee that the planning commission that the planning commission is willing to do that but unless the board of supervisors would rather establish the subcommittee and then have some of the recommendations for who should be wanted to review these rules. Great. <laughs> right now, who is anticipated working the subcommittee other than committee Nothing members? has been the idea to form a subcommittee. Haven't put any people. I know Mr. Breeden has offered to chair that subcommittee if it came to that. Um, but right now it's in the planning stages. And this res the, one of the reasons they wanted the Board of Supervisors to instruct community development not to, to take a pause on the application process so that the subcommittee could get to work doing in-house independent study of our rules, if we want to continue to allow utility scales, if we need to tighten up, just basically take a pause, get people really looking at this in depth. I think Ed and I had discussed or talked about where the expertise would come from for this subcommittee. Well, as far as the subcommittee, uh, the way I envision from talking to the planning commissioners and others, is basically reviewing of the available data that we have and really taking a pulse of the community um, in terms of whether we want to allow utility scale. And if we do, under what circumstances. And part of it is to, uh, the Planning Commission is concerned that if, the, uh, if we get some applications in right now, our ordinance isn't strong enough. Um, so that is a concern and then this was an effort to make sure that we have all our ducks in a row before anybody came in. So uh, the subcommittee idea would be uh, whoever we appointed to review that information. Go ahead. I've got, I've got, All right. a couple, I've got a couple of things in my head. The, the Planning Commission, you may defend the, my statement, but the comp plan is number one. And you're, uh, are you on time? Are you behind schedule? I think that's your number one focus right now. That's your no, the, the updated ordinances, as far as uh, community development goes, the ordinances are the number one thing right now. It's getting the revised ordinances through. The comp plan um, at this point, um, I believe July 1st, we will put out an RFP to bring in a third party to help us uh, put that together. But that's when we're putting our RFP. We're constantly doing the comp plan. I mean, every the ordinance, all of it's, but the formal part of it isn't going to really start to July 1st. Another comment would be, Well, use lack of a better word, it's too ancestral to have the same people that just went through this process right. to stand up a subcommittee to study it again. And you can look at the opposite way and say, well, we already are familiar with it, so it should come out of this quickly. This is my opinion. So that that may be where, where I am on it because I'm not, I, I don't, it's a conditional use permit, right? Right. The and way it sits right now. So the, the ordinance. Whether or not the wording of the ordinance itself isn't strong enough, I'm not sure that that's, you know, it's a conditional use permit. Right. We go through what we just went through, put conditions on it, we do the same. So, but but I, I do share Ed, Ed's, Ed's concern here that I think just having the Planning Commission work on this, I don't know. I would like, to, if we're going to form a subcommittee to really work on this, I would like to see um, kind of a, a diverse representation on there, not just consisting of Planning Commission meetings, but, you know, People from the, one of the biggest communities that's going to be impacted by this is the farming community. You know, um, we should have we should have somebody, maybe not on any of our current boards or commissions, but somebody from ag, maybe even somebody from ag who has some expertise in this and some experience with it, on this type of thing. Somebody, the, you know, the other one, the environmental community is very concerned about this. We should be reaching out to uh, a diverse spectrum of people to try to get input and information on this, as opposed to just having you know. Two members of the planning commission plus a board member, you and know, trying to, try to parse trying to parse out a bunch of articles. So yeah. that's he, like we're going to go he this route. We're going to. I don't want to do this just to delay and belabor this because we know we know that there are probably other applications coming. You know, we, we feel like 
we, we, that one was like drinking through a fire hose, and maybe we want to take some time and make sure that we've got all the information together, we've got a really good understanding and can maybe make this work better for residents, for the industry, so that we've got clear expectations, kind of like what we did maybe with uh, cell towers or something like that. Um, but I don't want to go through kind of a pointless exercise just to delay hearing any more solar applications. You follow? Oh, yeah, sir. So um, <laughs> if, if we're serious about doing this, I would like to see a, a serious effort to actually understand the industry, understand best practices, bring in people with experience, with knowledge, and with a diverse set of viewpoints on this thing so that we can actually get something that works for everybody. And as I said earlier, uh, Chairman Wagner did talk to me okay. today. One, if, if this is something the board would rather spearhead as far as putting together a subcommittee, of course. Well, I, I think if the planning commission wants to kick this to to a subcommittee, then I would think that the board, my at least my opinion at this point in time, would be the board would want to have some some more input in how we impanel this. Is how I feel right now. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. The other thing. I think we need to look at too, in my opinion, is, is what does King William residents want exactly. as far as our percentage of use for the entire county, not limiting one one group or one acreage, but what is the percentage overall of this county want? Travis and I have discussed this, I think, well, recently. But is it possible to get something on the order of a referendum at the November ballot to assess? Maybe not a referendum, but to assess what the citizens want. How else do we do that? We can't put anything on the ballot, because I've tried to do that before. The county attorney says, because that's what I've said, why can't we put something on the ballot for the people to vote on? They said we can't do something. That would be a perfect time. Well, what, yeah, uh, it's not, what, what qualifications, not what do you have, what is the standard? That I don't know, because I guess we've tried it before. They won't let us just do like a ballot of just what the county might want that's not allowed on a, on an election, I guess we need to talk to maybe Andrew. Well, there's there's yeah, Dylan, there's Dylan rule stuff to play here. Right. I mean, we can put things on, you know, referendums that we're empowered to put in referendum form by the state, or are mandated to, mm -hmm. in the case of right. Well, um, but just a general polling of the right. residents so of an idea on an issue is not generally something we're empowered to do on a ballot. Um, I'll remind everybody also that um, you know what generally you know democracy is. Uh, you know, Pack of wolves and sheep voting on who's for dinner. Um, so, you know, if, if you get a simple majority of residents that say, well, we don't want solar, you That's are running true. into some landowner well, right issues as well. So, and if I may, as far as I want to go back to something you said earlier, as far as uh, concerns about new applications coming in and not having the ordinance ready or not. It's a conditional use permit. No facility will be able, even if they put in an application, they still have to be all. There's nothing by right here. Okay? No by so, right yeah. at all. For the um, but again, I'm fine with this. I just don't want it to be. We're going to do it. I want to do it. In, in, in I want to do it right. It's an easy thing to say. But I think in order to do it right, then I think we need to get um, you know a broad cross section of viewpoints on this. And what, um, as far as uh, back to my part, you know, comp plan versus ordinances, part of the ordinances um, revision, of course, is solar. Um, and just going through that process, we have to get a lot of public participation. I mean, we're, we're reaching out, and there's no reason through the course of that that we're not going to reach. Him. I'm going to hear about whether somebody wants solar or not, no matter what, at any public hearing. And so, that would be one of the areas where we can start gauging some of the overall county. To me, to me, irregardless of, of what the planning commission comes up with or this individual commission, at some point in time, it's coming. Sure. We, we're going to have to decide what our threshold for pain is, period. It's not going to be, right now everything's in the fourth district, period. We might have 10 more. Is that going to be enough? Oh, don't worry, the rest of them will be probably in my notes. It's plenty of pain for them to go around, but at some point in time, we can, we, can, uh, we can do whatever they recommend, but at some point in time, everybody here is going to have enough pain. Okay. Why don't we do this? So, the Planning Commission meets this week, right? Yeah, well, Thursday. Thursday. They, they plan to 
do something to act on this subcommittee then, right? Why don't they put together a, a, an idea of how they want to impanel this, bring it to our regular meeting, and we can approve it, deny it, edit it, et cetera, if that sounds. I, I think they'd be good. comfortable with that. Okay. I'm looking over at the chairman of the board right now. <laughs> <laughs> And like I said, you don't make it sound like it's the planning commission. The planning commission is not going to be on this committee. So that's a big side. Sure. What? Okay. One person. Yeah, yeah, one person on a field to bat through. Well, yeah, that's two. Right? Yeah. Well, that's sure. Well, that's I would think that there might be at least one. Yeah. But but like I said, it's not going to be all the planning commission right. members plus one or two other people. And actually, if we had talked to Mrs. Graves to be on well, the committee. So she's already. She's already. She's already, be, she's already agreed yeah. to be on the work group that I'm doing that the board on the negative. So. so to me, it's just a matter of how many, how many of them we want. Right. That's that's me. I mean, they're coming. We can we can do something about it, or yeah. we're just kicking the back of it on that. Right. But I mean, I, I, I don't. If I express. Yeah. And like I said, the, 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 the reason we're doing yeah. this is because of our plan that we came up with three or four, five, six years ago, it was like I said, the three pages, which wasn't very specific. The one that we've just come up with to fit this particular uh, in installation is what we're basing it all on, which is like, what, 11 pages now? And so, but the thing is, if somebody puts in an application now, they'd have to go and steal the original three page one that we came up with, which isn't very specific. Yeah, no, I get why you're doing it. I think it's, I think it's, it's worthwhile doing no, it. I want to make sure that say, y'all make it sound like we haven't done anything. No, 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 we came up with this, it's a lot of stuff think, work we've done yeah, to come up with that. these. Requirements. Yeah, so it's all, not like they're all for nothing, and we're not no, no, stupid. No, no, no. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. That's how no, I'm saying. No, no, no. The only thing no, 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 no. is that as all of you talking, I can't yeah. hear what anybody's saying. The only thing that I'm saying is, at some point in time, we're going to have to decide. Right. Yeah. And that we can tell that's what the Vega was saying. Because it's all the one in other districts, or or you become maybe. And there are requirements. Jason and your opinion will greatly change. Um, I will take that back to the, at our meeting, uh, planning commission. I'll explain all that. What, because the idea of this tonight was basically to make y'all aware of where we're heading, yeah. and that's y'all's next well, right well, meeting well, when we adopt it. So, we wanted to make it and we'll get all, I'll get all the details. We'll work that out at our next meeting and get you all the details you need on. I think, despite whatever offenses may be taken, <laughs> intended or unintended, okay. I think we're on the same page. Yeah, uh, it sounds like okay. everybody's on the same page. Yeah. It's a good conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Any other discussion? Okay. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now let's move on to the really kind of. Oh, <laughs> you know, last time I came in front of this, I followed Laura. Now I follow Ron. Oh, How about a happy intermission before the finance starts? Were you serving your own? I wish. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I'm the 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 my car. Right. Hmm. You should have before we came here. So, Bobby asked me to come um, to do just a brief overview of a project that um, I've been working on since I came. Uh, five weeks ago, believe it or not, and um, right out the gate, the first week we were here, we met uh, with Nestle Purina and talked to them about the process of how we would get a dog park, and of course, this is their business, this is what they do. Um, I thought it would be a huge process to go through all this, and we sat there and he said, yeah, let's do it. So. Coming back and doing um, some research, we looked at their mission versus our mission. Our mission really is to serve everybody in the community for leisure opportunities, facilities, and services that enhance everybody's life, and yes, even our pets. Um, so in looking at that, we talked about, you know, what do we want to do? What is, what's the problem? The number one problem is people are traveling to Mechanicsville, to the closest dog park, to Pole Green Park. 28 miles round trip from the center of King William, so much further for some, um, 36 miles round trip. So in looking at that, you know, that's, that's a little bit of a distance. If you've got a dog in the car, maybe you have a couple of young kids in the car, um, it, it certainly could become an issue. Environmentally, um, currently right now, believe it or not, the citizens of the county are taking their dogs into the ball fields and letting them fertilize the grass, which we don't want. Um, so this would eliminate that. And it, it does happen quite frequently. 
Social, socialization, not only for your dogs, but for others to come out, share their interests with their dogs, meet people, talk about what's happening in the community. Um, so we think there's a lot that could come out of that. Um, this dog park that we're looking at would have two separate areas, one for large dogs, one for small dogs, um, with some play space inside of them. Um, even though we live in such a rural area, a lot of people will not let their dogs off the leash when they can in their yards, especially during hunting season. Uh, I think myself, I know we won't let our dog in the backyard just for fear he's going to get shot. Um, so here's a solution. Us partnering up with Nestle Purina. Um, some of the positives that are going to come out of this is, you know, we have 838 dog licenses right now. There's much, much more dogs than that in the county. Um, they will have to have a license to come into the park, so we're going to capture that. Not saying we want to play dog police, but we want to make sure everyone has that license. Um, along with that, too, when I mentioned the family traveling out to Pole Green, if you've got two or three kids in the car and you're heading back home, where do you think they're going to spend their money for dinner or for ice cream or for a soda at the local store? They're going to spend it at Mechanicsville. So if they're here, right around the corner, they're going to hit Valero or Burger King or Food Lion and stay within the county and spend their money. Um, we're going to make it as comfortable as possible. There's going to be some shaded areas, some benches um, to make everyone as comfortable as possible. And we all know a healthy dog is a happy dog, and a happy dog has a happy owner. Sort of like that happy wife, happy life thing. So here's just one of the, um, the shades that we were going to get, the cantilever shades. They have a long durability, come with a great warranty. These are really popular in parks and recreation facilities. And I'll show you in a second what we're planning on having. So here's an example of some of the benches we're looking to have, obviously all theme related. Um, and I know it seems silly, oh, who's going to worry about benches? But it's about reducing isolation, getting to know people, sitting with people. It gets you more active to walk over to the bench, to sit up, to do different things. Buddy bench, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. That would be outside of the dog area, and it's really for if you go by yourself and you're afraid to go and interact with someone and you're sitting in there, it encourages someone to come sit down next to them and say, hey, I'm Jennifer, what's your name? Um, that's the whole purpose of that bench. So we're getting a little bit um, above the level in there too. This obviously, why should we have dog parks? Excuse me, my throat's going. Um, and this actual picture is the exact dog park that we would be looking at, except it's black fence instead of green, but we're not sold on black if someone wants green. Um, studies show that a dog that is exercised and active um, shows less behaviors, being more obedient at home, less aggressive. Uh, Fencecapes was the uh, lowest bid so far that we got. They do a great job. He's actually done most of the dog parks in the area. He just put two in at Grace Point um, campgrounds. So here's a good part, the funds. It's about, right about $21,000. Um, this is everything that it includes. The benches, a fun fire hydrants, some toys for the dogs, trash receptacles, um, the fence, the gates that go in and out of it. Um, you can see fence is 7,300. All of the rest of the equipment is 14,000. And 100% of it is funded by Nestle. We would of course be responsible to put rules up. That's part of um, the legal aspect of it. They're pretty standard. Um, can't be under 16, no one under five. Can't have puppies in there, dogs in heat. That's it. We have to be have somebody there to uh, check the licenses or how would? We would talk with animal control and, and see if they could do just a regular routine, but we also gonna have somebody working in the park. Um, so he would go over there periodically and just say, hey, license check. All right. And they have to be visible, so it would be a matter of just looking. Come on, y'all were so talkative before. <laughs> I cannot. We don't have to pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> the, only thing that's the, us, the only thing that's saving us for me is that if Nestle Green is going to pick it up, 
That's the only way I would vote on this. Repeat that. That's the only reason he'd vote on it. Next week, Arena is picking this up. That's the only way. Where is, where is the lane coming from? It's going to be in the park, in the back of the park, up on the hill. Already sort of planned out in your mind, anyway. Yeah, it's the only spot in there that's really unusable property. And what they, what they were saying earlier, you're not going to have an employee that has to stay at the entrance. No. <laughs> no. By posting all of these rules and regulations, that covers us. So if there's any negligence, we have that covered underneath there. But no, we'll do spot checks, animal control. Um, we'll go out and do spot checks. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much self-run and self-monitored. People actually drive to Hanover so their dog can Absolutely. Yeah, they do. Yep. If you go to that point, we have all the national. And we would not limit this park to yeah. county residents either, correct? No. No, and actually one of the benefits of it is the toys and the activities that are in there are really, they sort of stand alone compared to other dog parks. Other dog parks are just the fence. By having these additives in there, and it's going to be really nice. I think it'll be a destination spot. I know it sounds silly, but um, people that are into their dogs are really into their dogs. And I don't think we're not paying for it to eat. I promise you, I would have not have done this if you were paying for it. Could you lock them into a ten-year-old like this? Well, it's um, things are going to have to be replaced. And yeah, it's, uh, they they are an, an easy, easy. Set, they will be on board for it. Um, there will be some promotional um, appearances and uh, their St. Louis, their headquarters, they'll, they'll come out for it, so it'll be a news spotlight. Um, so hopefully most of you would be out there for that. Maybe not a... <laughs> I'll, I'll say you probably could have convinced me to, to vote for this, depending on what fund it would have been paid out of. <laughs> and, and that's the difference in people. And I would not have been one of these people. Right, I can't be one of them. They're easy dressers. It's just, just a man of people. And a serious note, are the owners the ones you pick up? Absolutely. So we have receptacles out there with the little trash bags. Sorry. These would be grass areas. That almost from over here it looks like dirt. Yeah, it's just grass area. It's what there's what's there now. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Do you have a presentation online that we can see? Yeah, I can send it to you. Absolutely. Get it, so. Absolutely. Come on, Stuart. I wanted to say it so long as we don't have to pay for it. It's the first one to say that, actually. I do before I leave have some very good news for you. Um, my staff have been working super, super hard. And actually, since last time I spoke to you all, they have collected um, $25,000 in past revenue. That was unclaimed, uncollected, people who did not pay their bills, $25,000 in the last two weeks. Did you hire a or something? Well, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, $6,000 more than what it was at our meeting, right? See, yeah, I just said, it's $6,000 more than whatever since last, well, since last Thursday. Yeah. Our, our girls don't mess around. No, we can only get a television. Huh? Did you hire him out of Gary Woods on? Great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is your phone call for you. Wow. It is. It's about the same time. Next item on the agenda is an update on Pistol for Year 21 budget activities. Oh, this is Natasha. Sure. Journal. 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 Oh, you changed. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, congratulations. Well, with all these people carrying their name. Yeah. Journal. <laughs> I didn't catch that the first time I looked at it. Alrighty. Well, the material I presented is for informational purposes. Uh, the first slides are listing um, current reimbursements the county receives from the compensation board, the current salary for each position along with staff before the department, and a breakdown of the amount the county supplements. So what we've got, what we have here first is the Commissioner of Revenues. Right now the compensation board uh, reimburses us 89 .43. The county, the current base for her with her staff is 191287. So the comp board reimburses us the 89043. 
So if you look at that, the county is supplementing that salary at 102.244. Commonwealth's, Commonwealth's attorney plus his staff, I need to go ahead and make sure that that is said, that this is not just the constitutional officer's, officer's salary, but their staff also. Um, so we're looking at 176.392 for the base salary for the staff. Comp will reimburse this 153-121, so the county then absorbs the 23271. Treasurer's office plus staff, 194-282 is the current base for that department. Comp board reimburses this 85-343, and the county picks up the 108-939. And do you want to note this is only salaries, does not include the fringe benefits. Oh, yeah, we can, it's a little difficult because of, the, you know, what they give us for the fringe benefits, so that's why we kind of just left that off for right now. But if you did need some, some numbers on that, we can probably work through it. Gosh, I don't think I'm grasping this. Um, Commonwealth attorney, treasurer staff, the department total, they're almost opposite. Why, why is that? What do you mean? Um, This is high, this is low, this is low, okay. this is high. So, yeah, so that is what the comp board gives to us. This is the, to okay, it's kind of, we've got a little, maybe, maybe not, it's not this. If you kind of, if you, I guess the reason why we did it this way is so you could say, that plus that is that, that's what we're getting to. But basically, that's what we're paying out. So we pay this out, and then the comp board is reimbursing us this. It's just the Commonwealth's attorney staff doesn't, they pay a lot more for their staff than they do for the others. It doesn't matter. It depends it's on not the right. comp board. Right. It's not our decision how much, we, just because they got more and they have less. It just happens to be a lot more for a Commonwealth's attorney than it is for the right. treasury staff. Yeah, and <laughs> if, if we, could, we could drill down to actually see who's... Um, part of like this for the Commonwealth's attorney who is part of this 27 of his staff I could have done that okay. but I just kind of want to give you just an overall now the comp board will not reimburse them you know for everyone that works for them uh, Mr. Wick's one of them where they are only reimbursing them for I think one staff member it, it just it's, it varies and there's no way for me to actually even see when they submit the request, when the constitutional officer submitted to the compensation board, I cannot see what they're requesting. That's been one of our issues too, because it's hard for us to budget. Um, when we get down to the general registrar, you'll see, I actually was able to get on the phone with somebody from the Department of Elections today to get a better understanding. How do you come up with this number that you're sending to us? So, but with comp board, they're very, no, this is what you're getting, and that's it. Does it change annually, or is it, it? It's based on what the constitutional officer requests each year. Oh, so it's not a percentage, like you said, and you no. don't see what they request. So. No, it's, but it's also based on if there are, uh, like last year, the compensation board received state funding for raises, oh, and so that 3% then is included. Is included. Okay. So the constitutional officers, that figure right there doesn't reflect their benefits, their health care and all that. The county still pays for that, right? Right, and when it comes to the fringe benefits from the compensation board, they're not they're not reimbursing us for right. Anthem or anything right. like that. It's more um, their group, I think it's their group insurance, their BRS portion. I can I can give you that, though. They so give us a uh, lump sum amount, and then you can request reimbursement on benefits up to that amount, and usually it's, it's a nominal fee. As yeah. treasurers, it's yeah. like, Six thousand or seven thousand. Yeah, it's not. That's what I told you. Aim it over. Ah, it's a move. I forgot that. Aim it, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 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 the 
There you go. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so then we have Patricia Norman, Clerk of Court. Again, plus her staff, we're looking at 254053 as the total overall salary. Comp Board reimburses us 187998 The county takes uh, goes ahead and picks up that supplemental salary of 66055 Sheriff's Office. And... This is for the current base salary is for reimbursable staff. I talked to Nita a little bit about that this, before I came in here too. Um, so what she was telling me is different types and number of positions is how the comp board decides on what they'll reimburse the sheriff's office to. So when you're looking at that and I say 895-520 is the sh uh, sheriff's base salary current, that is not including his entire department. That is just including the, the individuals that he's allowed to submit for reimbursement. And the compensation board will pick up the 704.57, so the county picks up the 191.463. And the clerk of court is all the clerk of court? I think it is her full time staff, not her part time staff. I, I can pull that though. I mean, it's circuit court. General District Court. No, no it's just Patricia, Ms. Norman's department. So if we added uh, new deputies, I think what the request was, what was it, four? Or four. Would, no, would it be any more compensation? Oh, for the, new, for the new positions that they're yeah. being requested 21? There's no new deputies. Oh, it's not. Mm -hmm. What if we did, would it be more, would it be more compensation? Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, constitutional officers could request it. Mm -hmm. Um, but know. probably if they don't fund it, then we would pick up the supplemental. We would just increase our supplemental support for the department. There's uh, no guarantee if we have a position yeah. that the comp board is going to fund. And general district and juvenile, they they're paid. They're not paid from the county. Their salaries aren't. That's what I thought. That's yes. what I was asking. Is there anything that's gone through the uh, legislative session that could change this? Once the governor signs the budget that you're aware of, is this anything that might, changed? Might be beneficial. Yeah, but, um, yeah, but these numbers for the comp board. We, no, we no, stay up with what the comp board is doing throughout mm -hmm. the session. And mm -hmm. I mean, this time I think they were looking at trying to do some more for um, the jails and potentially the sheriffs, but I. I don't even know if that went through. Well, the Humphrey Sheriff's deputy is rather publicly guy. Got shot down in the Senate. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But no, I'm unaware of anything that was back comp board this year. Really? They found something. I think he was just saying that. I think I look funny. It actually was not the Sorry. Went back forward instead of back. It was all good. Ah, there. One more. Oh. Oh. Okay. Got it. Oh. Sorry. So, uh, so we got the Department of Elections that reimburse us for the general registrar and the electoral board. Base salary right now is fifty six seven fifty two. The Department of Elections will reimburse us thirty nine one twenty seven. And the county supplements the 17626. So when I was talking to um, <coughs> Mr. Hill at the Department of Elections, what he was telling me is um, the base salary, we, we do get a memo from the Department of Elections um, that tells us this is the base salary that we would, uh, would like um, the state other counties to pay, and that's based on population. But what actually comes to us is it, it depends on what the General Assembly is going to give to the Department of Elections. So that's how that, so it's 70% of what that base salary is that they tell us that, that we, we need to, um, a minimum of what we pay to the General Registrar. And 70%, that's where the 70% the is calculated on that number, not on the number that we actually pay to the General Registrar. 
So our registrar is paid a little bit higher than the memo has stated from the Department of Elections. So we are paying, we are adding a little bit to that salary. But the remittance from the electoral board had not changed since 1990. Right, since uh, something. I think 86. Yeah. Yeah. That was a long time ago. Yeah. That, that, that salary that they gave has not changed. Not changed. So then we've got the total base salaries that we are um, paying out for the comp board and Department of Elections is 1.7. So the total of reimbursements from the state is 1.2. So county supplements that those salaries at 509,598. <laughs> The remaining slide is a list of department requests for additional staffing. When the board is reviewing the overall budget, this, this background information will be helpful as you evaluate the requests. All the requests combined are difficult expenses for us to fit within our revenue projections. The county administrator is tasked with reviewing these requests and making recommendations. So we have Finance Department, we are asking for a fiscal assistant to assist with Finance Department daily tasks. Examples of, are, of that is revenue transmittal, transmittal to the Treasurer's Office, data input, support for general tasks within the Finance Department, and assist other departments with the PCAR program. And I could go on and on about that PCAR program, but I need to stay focused on everyone else, not finance. <laughs> <laughs> Information Technology. We are looking to hire a full-time technical support specialist. This person would assist in daily help desk tickets. And I do want to make a, uh, just clarify, we um, have Travis um, Wolf working for us now full-time. Not Pete. Yes, I know. We're having a hard time. Every time, we've actually decided to go with the last name, but I think we'll talk about people in the office. Because <laughs> Bobby's asking, which Travis are you talking about when we mention Travis? <laughs> but he has. Better than working on code. I feel bad enough to try and pronounce my last name. <laughs> I still struggle. Well, he is going to need some additional help with the um, help, the daily help desk tickets. Currently, he's he's cut that down to probably two um, by probably by the end of next week. We hope to actually cut off that service that we have in Code Blue for help desk tickets, and Travis will just go ahead and have everyone talking to him. If he needs to escalate it to a higher level with Code Blue, we can still have that. We're working on developing an hourly rate. But with the new implementations of the financial software, the, uh, the assessor software, Motorola, E911, Travis Wolf is going to definitely need some assistance on just, hey, I need someone to go fix that printer in that office. Just the little stuff. That's what we're really trying to get someone in here to help him with. Um, so we have, uh, so we want to have that person assist with that because we have the ongoing projects that I was just talking about, the implementation of the financial software, the assessor software, the Motorola new towers, 911 enhancement. And Travis has also been tasked with um, developing best practice policies involving IT for our staff. Excuse me, what is uh, Travis's salary? Travis? Cool. Uh, I'm in the private sector. Four or something around there. <laughs> okay. Travis Wolf. So I'm in the private he's, sector. I don't he's being so okay. Yeah. yeah. Wrong Travis. I'm a little The meeting's running late. I'm trying to keep it moving along. Okay. Oh, okay. Mark's <laughs> correct. We, we're, we're looking for a recreation assistant manager, a full time position to assist the recreation manager and provide additional support for the anticipated additional classes and programs. Commissioner of Revenue has requested it a one additional full-time deputy position that will focus on land use and additional support for the commissioner's office to maximize, re maximize revenues. How many are in there now? She right. has... Three. She, right. Three full-time. Yeah. So she, she just four hired four. a new person, yeah. This would make sense. Four staff. Four including salary or not including Four plus salary. Right. Regional Animal Shelter is requesting a full-time position um, of assistant manager. This is a full-time position to assist the animal shelter manager in the efficient and effective daily operations of the animal shelter. 
planning department is requesting a full-time planning technician. This would be funded from the fees gener generated by the solar project. General Properties is requesting a maintenance assistant manager. Full-time position to assist with daily tasks and delegating tasks to staff with General Properties projects. General Properties is also requesting a custodian, one additional custodian, to support the additional property custodial needs. The Sheriff's Office is request, or requesting full, four full-time deputies to provide support for the additional court dates each month in coverage for the expected development of several new residential areas. Fire and EMS have requested an addition of three full-time fire medics to provide support for the county's increase in fire medical 911 calls and the expected increases with the influx of new commercial and residential development. Fire and EMS has requested one full-time position to provide support to department administrative staff with paperwork and maintaining up-to-date records of certifications for the state and federal compliance. Fire and EMS has requested a full-time uh, battalion chief, a full-time position, to have command office to backfill in the absence of the fire chief. This position would facilitate, facilitate the administrative operational information between the fire chief and the operations staff to provide a span of control to management services having a positive impact on the service provided to the citizens. And again, um, these were just some, this is just information that I did want you to be aware of when we present to the present the, uh, the budget to you, you see in a column the par department requests, and you're going to see that it might be a lot higher than what the county administrator has recommended. And these are the kind, this is the kind of information I think you're going to need to kind of see, okay, you know, what do we want to do? Um, it's difficult for um, Bobby to have to go through this and um, know that we, we've had a lot of asks with capital and with the, um, the, the additional staff. Um, this has been a really difficult budget. The, the, uh, the battalion chief, how would that affect the top administration that we have now? So what we could do is we could, the two battalion chiefs that work under me right now are both part-time, so it would cut some of their hours. Um, and then it allows for us to have a backup for the fire chief. I am on call 24-7. Um, it is rough. It is hard. I have to look. I had to look at my family last weekend and go, yeah, we can't go into Mechanicsville because I couldn't leave the county due to the staffing levels. So we need someone who can give the fire chief some assistance in that area. And then not only is the fire chief expected to do all that, but then to do that, but then also all of the additional work that goes to the fire chief. So we could move battalion chiefs around, have them work less, put, some, put them in the field, which would also allow them to backfill positions for call-outs and so forth, and that would give you two full-time people able to cover the county and work with each other to take some of that burden off and get more done. I can't, right now, I can't go to all the meetings that I should be going to. I will admit that. I, I either need to be here writing and getting us running as a new fire department, or I need to go spend several hours outside of our county going to emergency management meetings and chiefs meetings and regional meetings. So I have to pick and choose where I go and where I call in and, and I'm trying to be in seven different places at once. So that's where the difference would be. It would allow the ones that we have to come away from the office, go down into the field, be bodies in the streets, and then you have two people running all of the administration who can also cover each other. And the firefighter medic those are additional over what we just, just yes. did. Yes, sir. Okay, that's what I thought. Mm. One question, I guess. Um, do you typically try to prioritize these requests in some fashion so that if you don't get this, you get that? Not necessarily. Um, it basically comes down to what I have seen for the need for the last 12 months, what has been approved by the board, say mid-year, and um, what I think that we can actually squeeze into our revenue projections. Um, 
what I'm going to present to you is going to show you something to be thinking about. Um, March 23rd, I'm going to be presenting the county administrator's recommended budget. And like Natasha said, this has been a very challenging budget. One, because we have a reassessment going on. Um, two, we've assumed some additional um, expenditures this year. We had 17, 17 positions asked for. We had goodness, two plus million in capital requested, and um, the schools will be notifying us tomorrow. I mean, the first conversations that we've had with them, we have not seen what they're going to be asking, but the first conversations we had with them back in February was a $1.1 million operational ask and a $2.2 million capital ask. Anyway, we can't fit that into our budget. So this is a Here's the background so that when y'all come um, and hear my presentation next on the 23rd, and then y'all come in and sit down and really start going through the budget, you'll have a, a back history as to why I'm thinking the way I'm thinking and what constraints that y'all have to work under. Now, the county operational funding is uh, in fiscal year 2019 was 7.9% of the total budget. Uh, this fiscal year, it's 8.3%. That sounds like a lot. But when we're talking operational funding, we're talking, we're paying for the reassessment, um, IT software, annual software maintenance, insurance on vehicles, all county vehicles, and buildings, telecommunications, fuel costs, utilities, legal services, auditing services, broadband, maintenance service contracts for sewer, septic, wells, you name it. Repairs on every and anything, janitorial supplies, postal costs, training, membership, lease and rentals, uniforms, advertising, on and on and on. Okay, so you remember that 8.3%. So this is the way our budget breaks out. This is for fiscal year 2019 and 2020. So what you see is, you know, we have, like most businesses, personnel consumes a great deal. This is our operational that I was just talking about, the 8.3%. This is our debt service. Now, you'll notice that our debt service was very high and it's dropped, but that's also because we utilize some of the general fund balance to pay off um, some of the school's long-term debt to put us in a better position. This is the support for the King William County Schools. That's their operational support. And that also includes the um, state sales tax uh, that we give them. Our contributions to like uh, the library, Bay Aging, that's negligible. It's nothing. Our local state regional agreements, uh, that's all of our adult uh, security sale, uh, centers, that's the juvenile detention centers, that's VIPSA that picks up our trash. Um, it's just on and on, and I'll show you a list of all of that. And then we have our transfers, and the transfers generally relate to, um, like in 2019 when we decided to pay off some of these uh, loans early, um, or it's also our capital, because whatever we take out of the general fund to transfer to the capital for capital projects, that's how we do it. So here again is the fiscal year 20 and, uh, 2020 and 2019 revenues, and there again, in this transfer column, you see how high it is at 2.9 million because again, that is how we pay off that, those long-term debts and we did some refinancing. That did put us in a much better position. Um, but at the same time, we have limited revenues that come in. We have been working under an assessed property value for six years, 2014 was the last one. So we are still collecting taxes on what those values were in 2014. New, new homes built were assessed at the 2014 value. So keep that in mind. So, you know, our taxes, uh, our revenues are limited. Our public service corporation, where the arrow, the green arrow is on the left-hand side, those have basically stagnated. So uh, we're not even building in any growth in that category going into the 2021 budget. Personal property tax continues to go up. 
machinery and tools continues to go up. Um, of course, our local sales tax, which is the 1%, uh, also the state sales tax goes up because people are spending money, so thankfully for that. Um, but this is just kind of a breakout of how and what we look at when we are pulling together the revenue for our next budget. Now, this is expenditures, and this shows the 2020 and 2019 fiscal years. And there again, that chart that I just referred to, it's broken out. So what you have here is you have your personnel costs, your operational costs. So out of a almost $26 million budget, $2.1 million is our operational cost. That should tell you that the staff does a great deal with very little. And I will say that uh, our finance department, our HR staff, have done an amazing job. They have found us um, better insurance carriers, and they have um, gotten us on with new agencies and companies that have dramatically reduced the cost um, on a lot of the uh, fixed costs that we have, such as insurance and LODA, um, short-term disability, long-term disability, uh, which helps in the long run. Of course, we have the debt service. You know, the majority of the debt service is dedicated to the schools. This year, it's about 1.6 million. For us, the county, it's about 7, 750,000. <clears> and that's dramatically down because, again, we've refinanced and we've paid off early. Um, then you get down into the voluntary contributions, that little tiny minuscule section. That's basically economic development, arts and life, aging. You're talking 82,000 out of almost a $26 million budget. That's all we, we contribute. Okay, here's the local, regional, and state agreements. So when I give you my budget on the 23rd, and you have things that you want funded, remember that there are certain sections of this budget we can't really do much with. Um, the regional jail, we're going to fund them pretty much what they asked for. We included an additional 50000 because that's a piece of advice Mr. Hodges gave us a few years back, is never fund them at what they state. Always give, leave some extra because there were a couple of years where we blew the top off of the budget when it came to the um, adult jail. And the population is yeah. down right now. Yeah. But it could turn up. Mm -hmm. Could we make a normal commitment and withhold X amount in case they need it instead of giving it all to them? Is it? That's what we do now. Yeah. That's what we do now. We budget based on the best guess of what they're going to ask us for, and then we, you know, we give them what they bill us ultimately in the end, and then whatever rolls out. You know. But it sounds like they're putting a little fudge in there. Uh, well, yeah. Yes, because there was a year um, not too long ago where. <laughs> The ask had gone down significantly. There weren't, for whatever, we had a year where I, I don't know if there just weren't as many full moves or what, but not as many people ended up locked up. And so we went from like eight hundred to nine hundred thousand dollars. So we only got billed like six hundred thousand dollars. So the county administrator at the time said, "Well, we'll just put six hundred thousand dollars in the budget. We just save three hundred thousand dollars." That's not. Then we got a nine hundred thousand dollar bill, and we had to find three hundred thousand dollars to pay the bill. So, yeah, we, we give ourselves a uh, some leeway there, but that's, uh, forget the term, conservative budgeting in this instance. So, so we, we don't have a big one. We, we budget X number of dollars. Well, what they do is they um, they look at the historical, and then they tell us what their, their recommended projections are for us. And what we've learned is to always add in a question. 50000 is nothing because, you know, when the citizens start behaving badly, that just goes to the roof. Uh, same with the juvenile detention center. So it's better to have funding sit there that's available if we don't need it because they bill us quarterly on our usage. So, um, you know, that's the thing is we go through four separate times a year not really knowing if, you know, things are going to change um, for the worst. But, you know, just leaving that in there is a good idea because also then uh, if we have to we can also um, come back to the board and request when the juvenile budget blows up, um, which it has done in the past. Uh, the Merrimack Center has gone to a five-year average to try to take the sting out of um, uh, the increases, but 
there again, if you get one kid in the Merrimack and they wind up staying for 10 months, you've pretty much just blown the budget. So, so Bobby, there's, there's really three, I think, categories, and if I'm missing some, forgive me. There's, there's the two detention centers, and then there's CSA. Yes. that are built on actual use yes. that we have to take a good guess on that we have been bitten before guessing low. And in fact, uh, in 2019's fiscal year, the board had to approve supplemental funding for social services and CSA. It was like $250,000 mm -hmm. plus. Because uh, CSA has a lot of the kids that are in the special day schools. That's a requirement. And those are very pricey. We don't have any control over the um, weekly rates, um, it's, you know, there again, we're kind of blowing in the wind with so it's what just, happens. It's just an, an uh, anticipating cause. Right. We build our budget off of our best guess. We look at historical trends, um, where we can, we talk to the Commissioner of Revenue, or we go out to the agencies, uh, we do research, um, we do everything we can to come up with as, as you know, realistic a budget as possible. But there is no guarantee. And there are unfunded mental health issues that we are having to take care of that we have not in the past yes. in the correctional yes. arena. Very much. Um, under the regional agreements includes the uh, funding that we give to the three um, volunteer fire and rescue um, localities. Um, it also includes, you know, what we pay to the town of West Point for the unified tax levy, um, that agreement that we have, um, social services, CSA, victim witness. Um, and in a lot of cases, you know, like VJ, triple CA, and victim witness, we pay a nominal amount because um, we share the cost with other localities and there's state funding that comes in. So that does benefit us. And then, of course, we have the regional animal shelter. Um, that's our share. And then we share uh, the cost with uh, King and Queen. So, I mean, if you're looking at just the regional and local agreements, you're looking at about 4.4 million. And you can come in and kind of fudge a little bit on some things, but um, that's pretty much a standard 4.4 million. Why are we contributing to Madison and I this year? We did last year. That's, 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 my, that's my issue right there. This is 19. 19 we contributed to Madison and I, 28 we didn't. Okay. Well, we got, we, I, I see what you're talking about, we flipped oh. it because we were 1920, now we're 1920. Okay. So, mm -hmm. we only contribute this year to three, and then of course our own local. And then of course the county transfers, like I stated, um, in 19 it was very large because of the bonds being paid off. In 20 it's basically just capital. Do we know how these departments are spending out the, the tax money they get? The fire departments or all of them? Well, I you take care of King William Station One, but do we know how Station Two spends the money that we give them? No, we do not ask that. We've never had any kind of understanding where they gave us any accountability that I'm aware of. Why wouldn't we ask for that? Well. Um, right, yeah. That's the first thing I said. <laughs> we did not. <laughs> it's, uh, that would be a good thing for the Board of Supervisors to take on. What do you think? I agree. <laughs> you want to see people in here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's it's only fair. I mean, if we budget the money, they can come to us at one of as needed basis. They didn't like that. Well, We've never been so very it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sound it's concept. Money. Yeah. They still it's, don't like that. It's a sound concept. So sort of like schools do. Uh, but you know, sounds good, but it doesn't work. Well, I'm going I'm to have to say something here. Look at Station One before you start judging everybody else. To, I mean, we're spending a lot of money all over the county. And uh, right now, Mangahick and West Point are operating without career people. Well, I mean, they do pay them, I understand, but not true uh, career people. Well, I understand that, but when you, when you allocate a certain amount of money and just give it to an independent organization like they are, then they can spend it any way they want to. That's true. So they could come to us. 
and that's yeah, happened. Let's go way places. back, and all the stations were like that at one yeah, point, yeah, with, the, the with no checks and balances. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure yeah. it's good, honest people, but things yeah. can happen too. Oh, absolutely, yeah, they have happened. I'm sure across the county, I mean, but uh, you, I mean, you're welcome. To well, what we do is um, usually the request that comes in from these uh, organizations, it basically just shows what their costs are to operate, and then we just take it as the fact that we're supplementing um, their expenditures. Um, at the end of the year, they also send us the IRS 990s. Uh, that's a requirement, either an audit or um, an IRS 990. And since I don't feel comfortable requiring these volunteer organizations to have to do an audit unless that's another you know, $2,500, $3,500 a year, um, unless the county's going to fund it. And I just don't think the county's ready to fund an audit for a volunteer organization. So the IRS 990 is what we accept. My thinking is that if we were to donate and not give them $100,000, how much does that take off Station 1's responsibilities? Thinking that, that way. Is without them being an active part of this whole process, and I know that trials and tribulations y'all went through, but that's giving <laughs> giving money with no responsibility to, to report back on what it's being spent for. It's, it's well, as Bobby pointed out, we do we do require the 990 to be given. Now, what you know, there there's a legitimate question to be asked. Regardless of what amount of money you give them, what level of response can you expect from an all-volunteer organization? So, um, there, we have we have very much picked our battles over the last over the last several years with this. If I'm if I'm completely honest, and you know what what we get, I think, out of Manga Hick for what we give them is commensurate with what we've gotten out of other organizations in the past. Um, that, that operated the same way that they did, except for organizations that didn't operate that well, and now they're no longer in the budget. Um, so we, you know, we've been mindful of that. Again, if, if we were giving you money and you weren't providing any level of service at all, there's a line next That's to your right. name. Okay, so so let that let that stand for itself. Um, I just. Mangahick is not going to be receptive to the county coming in and trying to assume more responsibility or trying to place additional. Uh, either restrictions or responsibilities on them. So there comes a point of diminishing return. We'll give you more money, but you have to do more. I don't know how much more they can do. Um, and I don't know how much they can do at all if we then said, well, since you can't give us more, we're going to give you less. Uh, I think what they're doing right now is probably about as much as we can expect out of them, um, given the way that they operate currently. Uh, it, it, that's just me... From, from experience dealing with I this don't thing. Think, I don't think he meant to give them less. I think he meant to appropriate whatever amount of money we decided, which was probably pretty close to what, you know, what's been done in the past. Well, sure, and then that, that, that again, to my point is, is you could give them $200,000, right. but if they're not hiring, you know, a bunch of career staff, which that wouldn't fund, right. um, I don't know how much more you can get. I know that we have opened the doors to speaking with them. Um, about what we can do to help and what we can do moving forward. They realize that they are not making some of their calls. Um, they, we all know what's going on. We, you know, I've opened that door so that we can see how we can do that and what we can do. Um, ideally, it would be great if we could take two career fire EMS and, and at least start that way with staffing them up there. I don't my vision is not to take over that firehouse like we did one. That's not what I'm talking about at all. What I'm, I think I just, I'd like to see them better integrated into the, the total system. Yeah, it, we have opened, it has been, and um, Supervisor Mikowski said it, it, it has been a very touch and go, very temperamental cracked ice, and we have worked really hard to try to build a relationship and build some trust there with them where I mean, and when I was talking about air packs earlier, that's a perfect example. Like, we'd like to do it as a group, but we, we have to be very careful how we do it because they don't want the county to have anything to say about what they do with their air packs. So, yeah. they're good people. I know quite a few of them. And you've got to go back, yes, an ambulance is involved. But if you really look at what 
they did not guarantee us really hardly anything with that. Uh, we did. Well, they did that on their own. I mean, we yeah. stocked it, but they, they did We stocked it, but I, and, and they really, I think they've done what they can. Be careful. All I'm going to tell you is be careful what you're messing with. You end up with mm -hmm. three different career stations that we don't want to pay for right now. Please leave West Point alone. It is working. West Point's a completely, I will say that West Point's a completely different animal. And they do, um, in the time, that, just my short time here, they do present to us immediately what they're going to spend their capital on. Mm -hmm. Natasha has shown me everything. Like, so that's a completely different animal. They're apples and oranges comparing to the operations. Okay, moving on. Uh, this is an example of what we have supported the King William County Public Schools um, over the last three fiscal years, fiscal year 2020 back to 2018. And I, I put this up here because sometimes I worry that, you know, you're, you're only seeing what we appropriate, which is in 2020, the board appropriated 10 million, a little over 10 million. Okay, we also have to appropriate what their debt service is. We don't give them that money anymore. We keep it, we pay their debt for them. But that is out of a split levy proportion. They also receive about 2.2, 2.3 million in state sales tax. So when you're thinking about what we support, we're supporting almost 13.3, 13.2 almost $14 million. Then the state steps in, 11.7, feds step in, right at about a million, and then there's some local money that comes from whatever else. So the true budget for the school this fiscal year is higher than the county's budget. I need y'all to remember that because there's going to be a large ask tomorrow night, and when I bring you the recommended budget, it's not going to be in and it's not because I don't support the schools. I do. I think that I have shown that, and the board has shown that over the last several years, that they have had some major incremental increases. But the problem is, is that we live in a split levy county. There are constraints that come with that, especially on the way we spend our money. And we can support the schools to the very best of our ability, but we will never be able to support them like a non-split levy community. And this is why. Legislation cites that no town of West Point funding for real properties can be allocated to the King William County Public Schools because they are supporting their own school in West Point. That also means the split levy funding dollars must cover what we support the schools for their operational, their capital, and their debt. So that's a pretty large amount of money. You know, the legislation lays out the categories of revenue, like beef hold, the local sales tax, you know, vehicle license tax, the things that we can use that we don't have to worry about paying the town any kind of portion out of it. They allow us to use those categories, but at no time do they dictate that we have to give them, the schools, all of the revenue we collect in it. So, and then also if, you know, the resolution that came before y'all um, a couple of times uh, that got everybody's feathers up in a ruffle um, about us asking for some of those restricted funds to pay the county back for some of the things that we've been paying, um, it's because if the county pays for something for the schools and we don't use either the money that's set aside for the schools or the restricted general fund balance, then we owe the town compensation. Uh, and there again, I'll repeat, our projected revenue numbers that we use for the schools are generated through historical trends, the Commissioner of Revenue input, state reports, and everything. And um, one of the uh, items in the school board memo that went out to all of y'all, um, one of them was that they got shortchanged in 2019. There again, we projected the numbers to the best of our ability. And there were a couple of categories that did not come in at what we expected, to the tune of about 106,000. But that also means the county didn't collect it either. So it's not like we purposely withheld money from them. 
What is appropriated is appropriated. So, you know, when it comes to this budget process, you know, I'm going to bring you something for the schools. It's probably not, well, I know it's not going to be what they're going to want. It's going to be the best funding that we possibly can provide within the split levy formulas. Then y'all are going to appropriate in each of those categories a dollar amount. And what that means is up to. So if the revenue comes in higher for B poll than say the four hundred and fifty thousand that I have recommended and the board has appropriated, the county gets to keep that extra ten thousand dollars. If it comes in at four forty, then the schools don't get the additional ten thousand. It's that's the way it is. It's the same for the county. You know, I can appropriate a certain amount of money, but if it doesn't come in, we ratchet down our expenditures. And the schools have to understand that. Do they understand it now? I, I don't think they do. Buildings. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, this has been very disturbing to me, to be very honest, because if you look back at the last three to four years, we have really worked to support the schools. And, you know, one thing that we haven't been able to do is help them with their capital needs. But there again, it's because we have a set amount of revenue for the split levy that we can allocate to the schools. Well, if your operational costs continue to go up, we've taken care of dropping the debt, but there's still not going to be that much money left with the capital. So where we can, we do, but the county also has capital needs as well. Uh, we do the split levy reconciliation usually in October when the year end closes so that if any revenue comes in higher than anticipated, we do a reconciliation. Um, any that is owed to the school is then restricted in the general fund. Only <coughs> school use is included in the CAFR, um, our audit report, publicized. Um, finance will also send the reconciliation documents to the town of West Point, to the school system, and bring it to the board so that y'all are aware of what we're going to be using as restricted. And these restricted general funds can only be used for the school, but they can be used for supplemental operational costs, capital, or one-time projects. But they have to come to you, and they have to ask, just like with the emergency procurement. They asked for, what, $86,000. Y'all approved it, and so they're going to be able to utilize some of that $610,000. So it's, it's a very delicate balance. And no, we can't give the schools probably what we would like to do. But even when it comes to capital projects, that's a challenge. Because you know, if you say, well, we don't have the money in capital, so we need to take out a long-term you know, bond. OK, so you take out a long-term bond. That still has to fit into that school's debt service. And you know the last long-term bond that we took out with the school was for Hamilton Homes. That increased their debt service 850,000 a year. So you know, do I think that probably for some of the capital items we've been pushing off, we need to look at some type of long-term bond? But I don't think it can fit it within what we're funding the schools. It's between operational needs and debt service. And there are no other uh, long-term loans that we're going to want to look at paying off anytime soon because the county has six, and this includes the um, radio upgrade, Motorola, the $4.5 million. And then the schools have six. So, you know, the county is responsible for a total of 12. Thankfully, one of our loans is um, basically the equipment um, from uh, Station 1 that we've uh, purchased uh, from the volunteer organization, and that will be paid off in the next year. But here's the reality is that we don't really have any long-term loans, county or school, that can be paid off anytime soon, probably within the next, next three years. And all of these, except for the Soda Bank, are 350, 400,000 annual payments. So it's not, wouldn't be an inexpensive. And here are the critical needs for just to improve the business processes of the county. Um, as you're aware, we work with BAI Municipal, which is called BRIGHT, our financial system. It's a DOS-based system. It's very limited in its capabilities. Um, we get very limited support, and um, they really don't
don't do a lot in doing any upgrades whatsoever. So the uh, finance department has been looking and reviewing and talking to um, for several months now, and so we decided to go with Edmunds, which is a financial software system. Um, Natasha uh, and her staff um, basically negotiated an excellent deal for this county and the school, and so we are going to start implementing that in April? April. So that we can have that finished hopefully, um, probably by October? Uh, the next thing we also need is the assessor software system because we're using Bright for that. And with this reassessment, even though we knew we had a lot of issues, um, Bright is a horrible assessor's package. Um, so we're looking at visions. We're going to go ahead and sign the contract with that. That will be implemented about the same time that the financial software is implemented. That will be paid out of this year's um, operational budget. And that will give us an amazing GIS setup. It will also uh, be much more intuitive for the Commissioner of Revenue's Office staff. And um, I really want to sing the praises of Emily Teagle. Um, I hired her away from the Commissioner of Revenue. She's been working hand in hand with the assessors. Um, cleaning up stuff and bright so the transition we are going to have some really good information. Uh, civic clerk platform for the boards and commissions. Uh, we need to get a little bit more uh, current in the way that we handle things so the boards will be getting um, uh, put on civic clerk that will make it easier for us to get information out to y'all. Um, the board of supervisors will be the only ones with tablets. Um, everybody else can uh, use their laptops or tablets of their own. Um, but we'll be able to share things electronically, update things electronically, put it out to the web faster. Um, it's, I think, going to be a, a real blessing. Uh, the county website upgrade, that's Civic Clerk. That will be going live middle of uh, April. Uh, we've been very pleased with the company. They've done all the hard work, and uh, we just sit here and complain and write and edit. So um, we're looking forward to that. Uh, tough books, you're going to see that in one of the capital items for the Sheriff's Office. Um, that's about 130000 We are looking for grants for that. But these are the books, um, the laptops that are in the patrol cars, and they are old. And we have done everything we can to keep them running. Um, but it is time to replace. Uh, the next gen 911 fiber and equipment, thankfully Vita, and a well, Vita is paying for all of this. Um, we got a notice today that the $932,000 cost has now gone up to $1.24 million. Um, and Vita is covering it all. And we will start implementing this um, July of this year. It's July. We'll start the uh, deployment on that. Uh, the radio unit's replacements. Isn't, isn't there an increase monthly on that 911? That's what we're paying this. Man. That's not for three years after. That's what, I, after that's what I'm getting at, but yeah. it will happen down the road. Right, but there's um, the uh, 911 board is also looking at trying to come up with funding to help offset that cost more so than they already had recommended. <coughs> uh, radio units replacement, those are actually the units um, that are out in the field, and um, we had put that to be a replacement schedule starting in 21. I don't know if that's going to make it. It may have to get pushed back to 22. Uh, uh, we are also looking for grants on that. I think we may have actually found some that could offset some of that cost. The radio coverage project contracts, um, that's going to be with the cell towers. We're working on that right now. That's that $4.5 million project. And um, we are just clipping along. At the same time, Motorola has been extremely helpful. In fact, um, uh, one of the representatives from Motorola, myself, Natasha, uh, are going to go meet with the um, county administrator in Hanover and the uh, uh, communications director uh, because we've been told that this is a good time to negotiate down some of the costs. Uh, currently, we spend about 350000 annually to be on Hanover system and then about another 120000 for the Motorola uh, maintenance agreement. 
So we're going to see if we can you know, ratchet that down before Mr. Harris leaves. When we implement that, will we be able to do away with the agreement with, with Hanover all together? Mm -hmm. We won't. Uh -huh. This is just a, a more expansive phase with them, but I think that the cost will go down because we will have more cell towers, and so the coverage will be better. We won't have to utilize everything that we're utilizing in Hanover now. And then this is just the, the last information maintenance on existing business processes. Um, we're working on the master utility plan. We expect to bring that to the board um, for discussion and review in May um, because basically it outlines pretty much where we anticipate the infrastructure will need to go over the next 15 years, but a full presentation will be given to the board at that time. Uh, the class and compensation review has been completed. Um, Staff has made me aware that we have, uh, in, we're in dire need of financial policies, and that's not only for the staff, but it's also for the board. And one of the things is, what do you want as a board to have as a general fund balance? I think y'all have been made aware that, you know, with the flow of in and out of expenditures and revenue, that, you know, we dip into that general fund balance quite a bit. So um, Natasha will be bringing you policies on all kinds of financial things, um, and she'll be doing that in May and June, and hopefully being able to get that finalized. Ordinances, uh, the zoning ordinances are being updated uh, as we speak. Um, Brian and I have started working on the utilities, um, because of course with the transition of HRSD, a lot of that information is not accurate anymore, but all of our ordinances need to be reviewed and updated. And what we'll do is form small little groups, we'll work through them, um, then we'll send them to the attorney to make sure that all of the code citations are accurate and current. Uh, and then of course all of that will then come back to the board, public hearings and all of that. Uh, updating of the comprehensive plan, uh, we're putting the money aside in the 21 budget for the comprehensive plan. I think it's very critical that we have an outside contractor that basically keeps those benchmarks and timelines um, because we don't want to have another comprehensive plan that takes three years to, to finish. Um, by going through the ordinances, by um, what the EDA is doing, by what the board is doing, uh, and a lot of the other commissions and stuff, I think we're going to have a lot of good information ready to go, but uh, we're going to need somebody kind of making sure that we are staying on task and on target. And then the uh, emergency operations plan, um, with all of the uh, coronavirus um, information going on and concerns around the country, um, we brought out the emergency operations plan. That is supposed to be updated every four years, and fortunately, it's four years. So when we all sat down, we, we, we found that out. And so um, Chief Nudley has um, got a lot of uh, the additions, corrections, edits, Already, um, she's going to be communicating that with uh, Olivia, and we will get that updated and brought back. It doesn't necessarily address a pandemic, but it was a very good conversation starter. I learned a great deal, a great deal from Chief Nunley, from Sheriff Walton, uh, from Ann Mitchell with Social Services uh, in that meeting. And um, so we'll update this, um, maybe add a a little language, but uh, overall it's a pretty good plan that was developed. But that will be coming back to y'all hopefully in June for approval. So these are all things that you know we work on daily as we you know are doing other stuff as well. Um, but these are all critical for us to um, continue to focus on as we move through the next several months. Um, we been remiss in many ways on allowing a lot of our plans and standards to kind of languish on the shelf. Um, what my goal is before um, the end of September is to have a annual date set aside that everything comes back to the board um, for updating. You know, even if to say the water standards does not need any changes, it would still be brought back to say in that work session so that the board could be notified of that. And it's once again reviewed and pushed on, the next one coming up, so that they're living documents and the board has a hand in keeping things current. So hopefully that y'all will appreciate that type of your work session just dedicated to documents.
But that's all I have. Um, March 23rd, I will be bringing the um, budget to you. If you have any questions about them, please reach out to me. I'm glad to try to answer everything I can. I know that you all looked at in the past of uh, prorating personal property taxes. Was it a lot of public outcry about that? Or? Well, it seems that's, that's lost, right? Well, you basically the treasurer said it's going to be six and one and a half dozen and the other. Um, he said you're not going to see a significant gain or loss in revenue one way or another. It's just going to be more work on him <laughs> to figure out you know, when things left and apply that well, well, date. Well, most people, well, not most people, I know every time I buy a new vehicle is in January. Yeah. <laughs> out. But you know, that's one year that you don't pay personal property taxes. And I do understand that when people move, people can move out of the county and they're still obligated to the whole, the whole full year of personal property taxes in King William County. So that, that was, yeah, the treasurer was asked about that and he gave us, I don't know how many conversations you've had with Harry in the past, but it was well, about this. Well. <laughs> what, well, Ms. Tessner, what can we expect tomorrow night? Yeah. Won't be a lot of love. Uh, well, um, what you can expect tomorrow night is that they will present what the state mandates are, what their operational needs are, what their capital needs are. Hopefully, we'll give you an update on that ABM um, contract. Um, they may be looking at going into a second phase with them because the total need for the school was over seven million. And the first phase with ABM was only about four point something million. Um, but they will definitely, you know, make their case as to why we should try to fund them at what we were asking. But the reality is is that you know, we can do what we can. I mean, like what we did last year, is we kind of picked and chose. Like the social worker, um, that was something that we funded. There were certain things that we felt you know, extremely important, but um, the overall ask, like the health coverage, you know, they ask every year for additional money for the health coverage, and they're self-funded. So, uh, yeah. There's so much more. Yeah, and that's the that's thing. Bottom line. Part of, but once we give them their allocation, they do with it as they say. Right, that's what I wanted to bring up. They're telling everybody, when we give them, we can suggest that it goes to specific things, but if, if we say it goes to buses and this and that and that, and they decide to give it all to teacher salaries, that's what they do. We don't have any control over what they do. So that's what people don't understand. But I think somebody was asking if we could maybe give them to them in segments, and I think one year we are. Okay, we might, we might do that, but I don't know if that would really... Well, we, we don't give them the full amount of money up right. front. We give it to them monthly. As it comes in. As it comes in. Some of our revenue comes in December, and that's it. That's the only time that we receive it. Right. So tomorrow, tomorrow night is kind of, we just we so sit there and listen. And, and, and you have well, questions? That's a good thing. There's big questions. Yeah, the you, you can ask the question. It's, it's well, more of a presentation. <laughs> And the thing that we got in the, all the board members that listed went out to the, I guess I don't know who got it, but that was oh, the, yeah. all these questions were the things that Bobby answered. So I wanted to make sure everybody got a copy. Oh, yeah, right. She got okay. it. Yeah. I mean, she answered all those things already, so I didn't know how to make copies in case everybody didn't get it. Like I said, they didn't have it. Right. Can we get a copy of this? Yes, it'll be out on the web, but I'll send you a copy for saying anything. Anything else on that? Next item we have is the Board of Supervisors' request and the uh, extra section that Mr. Warren was asking for from, to add new items, I guess. Start this in, in the interest of time for Mr. Muskowski. I was going to say my request would be adjourned. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Two things. I would like to implement a public comment here in the work sessions. Yes. And also, I would very much like a split levy one on one presentation. Is it, it is due, if I'm not mistaken, it is due for renewal or. Yeah. 
You got about nine about years, years. Nine years ago. Yeah. They've uh, renegotiated that for like 18 months ago. That was the MOU. Um, but the split levy is, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's codified. So that's forever unless we amend that by a code. Um, but the MOU, um, which we call, I think, has been termed sometimes the split levy agreement, is a remittance that we give to the town annually in recognition of services that the town provides that uh, ostensibly saves the county from expending this Which same fund. That was what, 150000 mm -hmm. Is it still yeah. 150000 It's remained the same. And it increases with the CPI. In that yeah, year. yeah. Since I have three years and nine months to go, I'd really like to learn more about it. Yeah, I would. However, well, however I'm a, I, and maybe she will not agree with me, but my suggestion, if you really want to learn something about that, go to the town manager and John Edwards will go over the entire thing. Don't believe not. Mm -hmm. I would say we can uh, Terry Sand, we'll bring in Robinson Farmer County. <laughs> just just yes. remember the county does it to this class and they didn't like the outcome. So. Uh, Right. Uh, I think we're up to him, so we can get to adjournment. Move adjournment. Oh, nobody else has I'll second that. I'll second Motion to adjourn is never out of order and can never be debated. <laughs> <laughs> I guess nobody else gives any comments. Then. We have a motion made on the floor to adjourn and we have it properly seconded. Mrs. Lawrence. Mr. Garber? Aye. Mr. Warren? Aye. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> you stay. Uh, at least, at least try to hit who you. Want. <laughs> I didn't leave enough water in it. I remember next time. Right, you gotta go. Was that me? It, no, no, it was our neighbor. Mr. Moore, we've had that vote from that in before. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hodges. Hi. Mr. Greenwood. I'll have to abstain if we didn't finish anyway. <laughs> Meeting adjourned. Thanks everybody for coming. Oh man. Well, he needs to sit next time. Thanks. I have been sitting here for a few days. We're back. We've been up for it.